comes before. God's work in our lives even before we realize that we need God in our lives. But in some moment, the Holy Spirit helps us to say yes back, to make a decision to open the door. The moment where Christ's life and our life intersects, and that's justifying grace. That's the door opening up. So this is helpful for a pastor, low-hanging fruit, you might say, to come into a preaching week, and I already have a pretty good idea of what this image represents and what it says to us as Christians. But I proceeded carefully and did my thorough research anyway because it's referencing something out of Revelation. And Revelation is not a book to mess with lightly. It's complicated. If you've ever opened it up for yourself, you may know that. Or if you're afraid to open it up for yourself, then you already know that. The reason Revelation is complicated is because it's filled with lots of images. This is a, a vision of Revelation that a man named John has received, relevant to uh, the Roman Empire persecuting the church uh, in his time, and also relevant to what's going to happen eventually, uh, God's will at the ultimate end of time. So some of the images in Revelation are apocalyptic in nature. They have to do with the ultimate end, God's goal for the world. Some of the images in Revelation have to, have to do with the Roman Empire. And because we're distanced from that, they don't make too much sense to us. It works kind of like if I told you a story about a donkey and an elephant who couldn't get along, you would know what I was talking about, right? But someone reading that story 2,000 years from now would say, would think that I really had trouble with my animals fighting among themselves. So some of the images in Revelation are like that as well. They're difficult for us to understand out of the historical context. So carefully I went into Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, to double check myself and study. And I'm glad that I did. I realized right away that this passage comes in the context of John's messages specifically to the seven churches that Revelation is intended for. He has direct messages for each of them. And the last message comes to a church for whose name I continue to have trouble pronouncing, La Laodicea. And these La Laodiceans are lukewarm, John says. <coughs> And he is frustrated at them for this. They're uh, rich in this city, and so it seems that they are resting on the nice safety net they have in their riches. And John is telling them, make a decision. You're all wishy-washy about your faith. That you're maybe Jesus, but not if it gets too hard. You need to commit. And right after those words comes this. Behold. I stand at the door and knock. And in that context, it seems like an urging to say, hey, open the door. Make a decision. Jesus is knocking. Open the door to him. But then I took a step back even further and, and took a look at these seven messages to the churches. And if you have your Bible with you today, it may help to open up and to take a look at those opening chapters of Revelation. <coughs> There's a common thread among a lot of these specific instructions and words to the seven churches, and that is to repent. <laughs> to repent, a lot of people think it means to be really, 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 really sorry that you did something, and that's part of it. But in the original context, it means to be sorry enough that you did something that you want to make a 180 degree turn away from that something. You want to determine to do differently, to live differently. So to repent of your sin is to decide, I'm going to do my best not to do that sin anymore. So John, in five of the seven messages to these churches, has a word about repenting. In chapter 2, verse 5, he wants them to repent from turning away from the love you had at first. In chapter 2, verse 16, he wants them to repent 
from the teaching of Balaam and the Nicolaitans because you know that's wrong. In chapter 2, verse 21, he wants them to repent of committing adultery with the false prophet Jezebel. That seems like a pretty clear one. In chapter 3, verse 3, he wants them to repent from acting like the walking dead. And finally, in this last one, in 319, to repent of depending on your riches to the extent that you're all wishy-washy in your faith. Literally, the last word before this image shows up is repent. So the message we get is repent. Make a change. Repent. Do differently. Repent. Because, listen, Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. <coughs> and all of that has made me think about the role of repenting when we open the door to Christ. If there's no repentance involved when we open the door, it looks very different. It looks, well, something like this. Hello? Who's there? Oh, Jesus! Oh, super! Come on in! You know, Jesus, my house is pretty messy today. Sorry, but I know the best friends are those who can come over even when your house is a mess. Right? Right. So you come on in. I know you don't mind. Here, let me brush some crumbs off the table. Let's sit down and have a meal together. I'll see what I can pull together. Whatever is fine. Right, Jesus? Right. I love it when you're here. You just feel free to stay as long as you like. Now that's nice. But I don't think that's quite how Jesus comes into our lives. I think when Jesus knocks, it's more like this. Hello? Who's there? Jesus? Oh, hey, you know, not, not a good time. The house is really a mess right now. Could you come back um, maybe in a year? We can make an appointment and... Um, <laughs> Jesus, hi, do you hear me on the other side of the door there? It's really not the best time right now. Um, even if you could just come back in a couple hours, I could do a little straightening up and... Jesus, listen, I don't think you understand the state of my... I mean, it's really, it's really bad. I am just not prepared for visitors right now. What's that? <coughs> You, you want to come in and, and help me clean? Oh, no, I, I just don't think that that would... Okay, um... <laughs> Jesus, I am warning you. Look, I'll let you in, but I just want the record to show that I, I, I told you it is not, it's not great in here. It's not, I just didn't know you were coming. I didn't... See? Whew. Yeah, sorry. Oh, wait, could you not look under there? Oh. <laughs> Would you believe me if I told you those weren't mine? <laughs> <laughs> you want to start there? Could we start in the kitchen? I really like it when the kitchen's clean. No. Okay. Jesus, okay, let me be real for a minute. I really, I really kind of like that. I mean, and is it so bad? I mean, just... Okay. Okay, you can, you can clean it. What? Well, you want, you want me to help? You are not making this easy. Okay. Okay, here's the... I have the trash can. Are you sure? Just a little... Okay. You know, that does feel better. Okay, what are we cleaning next? Inviting Christ into our lives when repentance is involved is different, right? Out of those two scenarios, the first one is easy, and the second one is hard. The first one is kind of surface-level faith. And the second one is
is soul deep real. The first one will make little or no difference in how we live our lives. The second one will change us forever. Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. And he wants to come in. And he does want to come in like the best kind of friend. But not the kind who will just say, hey, everything's okay as it is. But the kind that we all need. The kind who will come in and say the hard words in love that we need to hear. And those who are here, who have opened the door already, can testify that Christ will come and stay as long as it takes. Keep cleaning us up bit by bit, our whole lives and then some, to make us that real new creation that God has designed us. That is what Christ is knocking at the doors of our hearts and asking us to do. Now many of you who are here today, you opened that door a long time ago. You have been doing that work. But there may be some of you here today who have never once opened the door. And maybe right now, you feel that knocking and you feel like you're ready to open it for the first time. <coughs> what I want to do is to invite us all to say a prayer together. Even if you have already opened the door, if you're like me, we can always stand for some recommitment. Am I right? Yeah. But if, if this is your first time staying in, I want to ask you to do something just a little bit different. So I'd like everyone to bow your heads and ready your hearts for prayer. And if you want to ask Christ into your life for the first time, I invite you to, to stand and to say this prayer along with us. Would you repeat after me? Jesus, I want you in my life. Jesus, I want you in my life. I have made mistakes. I have made mistakes. I have regrets. I have regrets. I am not perfect. I am not perfect. I have sinned. I have sinned. Come in and do your work. Come in and do your work. Forgive me. Forgive me. Clean me. Clean me. Make me new. Make me new. I need you in my life. I need you in my life. Amen. Amen. And I want to encourage you, if there are any here today who um, you feel that door opening for the first time, tell someone. That's what a church family is for, to be able to encourage each other. Um, you're welcome to come and talk to me. Nothing would make me happier. Or if that door has been open and um, you need help in understanding how Christ comes in, tell someone, talk to me, talk to anyone. That's what we do together best as church. Now, we have something to celebrate. So we have two new members of our church.